I am Professor Collins, and this is your Daily Dose of Statistics. Now today, uh, we're going to finish up our series on descriptive statistics. And so we've gone through central tendency so far, measures of distribution, and now we're going to be jumping into the normal curve. And this will, like I said, this will finalize our um, last piece of descriptive statistics and this little little piece of more slightly more advanced descriptive statistics. Now for the normal curve, we're going to be going over the bell curve, z-scores, probability, percentiles, and quartiles. Um, this is the the bell curve, normal distribution curve, um, this piece of this, if you're going to take anything from any of these lectures, this is the thing to take. Um, and this is the thing to really, really understand. If you're having a hard time understanding this, particularly the normal distribution piece, um, I would recommend reading some more on it or even trying to watch some more videos. Um, there, There's several, there's numerous videos online on YouTube that you can watch. Um, and I would recommend watching those. This is fairly, for some reason, it's hard for students to grasp this. Um, some students have a difficult time with this because it's kind of an ambiguous idea. So I'll try to put it as in the best concrete form that I can um, for this presentation. So let's take a, a, a dive into bell curves um, and let's talk about the bell curve. And so what the bell curve is, uh, first of all, it uses uh, central tendency and standard deviation. Um, it assumes normality, meaning that most of the scores are in the middle, and some scores are outliers on the outside, or on the high side and on the low side. Um, so the mean, median, mode are all the same, right? This is the assumption here. Um, we use the bell curve to calculate percentiles and probabilities based on z-scores, and we'll get into that. Um, and again, this is the, the basis for all inferential statistics. Uh, the, the, the assumption here is that uh, it, we utilize the, the idea of central limit theorem. Um, and so, it's, so again, it's extremely important that you understand this before moving forward, right? So, um, let's talk about central limit theorem for a second. Uh, the, the idea of central limit theorem is uh, first that increases in sample size increase the bell, bell curve probability. Um, increases in sample size um, increase population similarity and popula population distribution. And population scores are generally follow a normal distribution. Uh, and so what that means is uh, basically central limit theorem states that the more people you have in a sample or the larger your population, then the mo more quote-unquote normal your bell curve distribution will be. Now here's your basic bell curve, um, and we'll jump into this in a minute. So we'll talk about your basic bell curve. There's a short little video that I want to show you that it's just a few seconds that I think is really interesting um, that really demonstrates the bell curve. And we'll talk about, um, we'll, we'll apply the bell curve uh, for members of Congress, uh, just as an example. So let's jump into the bell curve. So this is your bell curve. On the y-axis on the left, it is the frequency of people, right? That's the number of people with a particular score. On the x-axis is your raw scores or your x variable, right? This is, this is your variable. And so as you can see here, what happens is most people fall in the middle, and the middle is the mean in this situation. So in any sort of distribution of scores, whether that be height or something like weight or um, something a little more ambiguous like intelligence, for example, uh, more people are going to be in the middle, um, and fewer people are going to be much higher, and fewer people are going to be much lower, right? So most people are going to be average, some people are going to, some but lesser people are going to be greater than average, and some but lesser people are going to be less than average. That's the basic idea of the bell curve. Now, I'm about to, I'm about to show you a video. So, um, what occurs in this video is uh, there's little beads that drop into uh, little columns, right? Little open columns. And so, when you're watching this bit video, think about each little ball or each little bead as one case. 
Um, and so our case in this situation, think of it as a student, right? And each student who takes the SAT, for example, um, will be one of these little balls. Um, and so wherever that student falls into, uh, whichever hole that little student falls into, will be his or her score. And as you can see, what will happen is most students, quote unquote students, will fall in the middle and fewer will be on the outsides. So we'll just uh, give a quick view on this video. <laughs> right, so as you saw in that video, Hobby Lobby, interesting. As you saw in that video, most of the scores were right in the middle, right? So most students in this case, there were the little beads, um, most cases uh, were, were the average, they were right in the middle. Um, but some cases were a little above average and some cases were a little below average. Um, but on the general, the general notion is that it's normally distributed and that's what you mean, that's what I mean and what statisticians mean by uh, when they say normal distribution or normally distributed. Most people are at the average and a greater or smaller number of people are um, either greater than average or less than average, right? And so the nice thing about this idea of the normal distribution is that we can actually use it to calculate things like probabilities, percentages, percentiles, uh, quartiles, so on and so forth, right? Um, and so, again, let's take this idea of years of service for Congress members. And so the average years of service for Congress members is about 10 um, with a standard deviation of two years. And so what we have here is you see that uh, right in the middle, so this blue little box down here is the number of years. And so what you can see is most Congress people spend roughly 10 years in Congress. Um, some people spend a little more, maybe 12 years, maybe 14 years, uh, 15. And, and then when you get way down into the tail 18, 19, 20 years, fewer Congress people spend that amount of time, right? Do the same on the other side. A lot of people spend 8 to 12 years in Congress, most of them do. Um, and then you get down to the lower ends where you have very few people who will spend maybe a year or a few months or maybe even two years, right? Um, and so the, again, the nice thing about this bell curve is we can actually identify the percentage of people who fall within this distribution. Um, so what you can see here is one standard deviation from the mean on either side, that encompasses 68% of the entire population. Um, so 68% of Congress people um, have spent between 8 and 12 years of their life in Congress. 95%, um, 95.44% 95 of Congress people have spent between 6 and 14 years, right? Because that's two standard deviations away on either side. And almost all Congress people, save for a very small percentage, um, have spent three deviations away from the mean, either above or below, right? 99.72%, um, right? So that leaves only point to 8% of Congress people who have spent more than or less than um, 14 to 16 years in Congress. Right, so this is the nice thing about the bell curve is it actually identifies the exact or, or, or a fairly strong percentage of, of people um, who sit within a particular distribution. So the great thing about this bell curve is that based on that, we can use this to calculate things like probability, right? And so when I say something like probability, it's the, um, the possibility of a particular score occurring. And I'll show you what I, what I mean. And we do this by using z-scores. So what z-scores do is they standardize raw scores into the same mean and standard deviation. So z-scores will always, this is a complete rule, this is law for z-scores, right? They will always have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Get this ingrained in your memory, you need this. Uh, z-scores are nice because they're useful for calculating probability and percentiles. And another really, really nice thing about them is you can compare scores across different scales or different time periods, right? Because what they do is they compare scores relative to a current sample or current population. 
And so, for example, if you took the SAT and I took the ACT, we would be able to compare our relative scores by transferring our scores into z-scores. And so whoever had the highest z-score um, would have done better on whatever mutual test was, was taken, right? Um, same thing, we can, we can compare, say, scoring percentage for Michael Jordan when he played versus LeBron, J LeBron James currently. Um, we can compare them on z-scores because they never played together, right? So we'll get into calculation of z-scores and then we'll give another example uh, and, and compare z-scores to raw scores in this case. Um, so, so the nice, uh, well let's, let's start with this actually. So the nice thing about z-scores, like I mentioned, is you take raw scores and you translate them into z-scores. So you remember how I said in Congress we had a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 2. Well, what z-scores what do is they translate that mean of 10 and standard deviation into two, of 2 into a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. So it was previously 10 years before in Congress, that's the mean, is now a 0 for z-scores. And so you can see the nice thing about the z-scores is if your z-score is below average, then you will fall into the negative, right? You will be negative say 0.3 or whatever it happens to be. Um, if you're positive, it means you're below, or excuse me, it means you're above average. So let's just use an example. Um, so here's our basic formula for z-scores. And so what you have here is you have um, uh, the, 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 the calculation for this is z equals um, x, right, the, the score on x, in individual cases, score on x, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So that's the basic formula for calculating z-scores. And so let's use an re actual real-life example. Um, Maria Cantwell is a U.S. Senator for the United States um, from the state of Washington, and she has served in office for 13 years. And so based on this information, what we can do is we can calculate z-scores. So you remember uh, Congress people's average in Congress is about 10 years um, with a z-score of 2. And so what we do is we take Marie Cantwell's years in office of 13 minus the average in Congress, which is 10, and divide that by the standard deviation, which is 2. And we end up with a score here of 3 over 2, which is a z-score of 1.5. So what we find is that Maria Cantwell has been in the Senate 1.5 standard deviations longer than the average senator because her z-score is 1.5, right? So we can tell by this that because it's positive that she spent more time in Congress than your average congressperson has. Or senator, I should say, in this case. Um, and so, so that's the calculation of z-scores, right? So these are important to understand and to know when moving forward because you can calculate um, any particular score z-score a crop and, and compare it to a, a distribution. Um, another nice thing about z-scores, which I didn't mention earlier, is that you can identify a hypothetical score and ask the question, where would this hypothetical score stand, right? Um, or what score maybe do I need to get in order to be above or below average, right? So you can use these scores as hypothetical scores as well and test them against the distribution. So let's talk about probabilities, percentiles, and quartiles. So these are all within the same realm. They're kind of the same thing, right? So remember, we talked about um, percent percentages um, versus um, probability earlier, or not probability, but percentages um, and proportions earlier, right? It's the same sort of idea. So, so watch that video uh, again. Um, quartiles basically identify which scores are at various quarters, right? So 25, 50, and 75 percent of a distribution. Um, and probability identifies the relative possibility of a score occurring, right? Or uh, another way to put it, um, a, where a score sits in a particular distribution. And so again, let's use Maria Cantwell as an example. <coughs> again, Maria Cantwell was in office for 13 years. She has a z-score of 1.5. And so say we're interested in knowing how many senators have been in office in, for less time than Cantwell, right? 
And so here's our distribution. Here's Cantwell's score. As you can see, um, she's been in office 13 years, and the years there are on the blue, uh, the blue boxes. The green boxes represent Z-scores. So as you can see, um, 13 years and 1.5 Z-score is in the same position, right? So here's her score here. Here's where she sits across this dis distribution. And so we're interested in knowing how many senators, or to put it another way, what percentage of senators have been in office less time than she's been. And we can use our, the Z-score to, to identify this. And so we have our Z-score, right? So what we need to do is go into Appendix A in the book. Um, and uh, there, the, so based on, so Appendix A is interesting because based on your research question is going to depend on which areas of the distribution you're going to use. Um, because we're interested in um, people who are less than Maria Cantwell, um, we could do add up area B plus B plus A, or another way to do it is just take area A minus one, right? Because um, what we're doing is, is minusing 100% from the tail. Um, so just take a look at this and, and kind of think about it um, conceptually and, and um, it, it will make more sense um, when you look in the book and kind of look up what those functions are. Um, but what we find here is that we add up these areas and what we come to the conclusion of is that um, Maria Cantwell has spent more time than 95.32% of the senators, right? So using the information from um, our Z-scores um, and using Appendix A in the book, we, we can identify this um, fairly easily and fairly readily, right? Another way to put this is, um, yeah, th this, actually, I'm just going to stay with that. That's, that's the best way to talk about this, is looking at that percentile, right? Um, and the, the probability is the same thing. We use the same numbers of probability, but probability is, is useful for being more hypothetical, right? So a different question would be, what's the probability for somebody to spend 1.5 um, years in Congress, right? And you can use calculations to identify that. So to interpret this, Cantwell has been in office longer than 95.32% of her colleagues. So this is the normal curve, um, the bell curve, z-scores, probability, percentiles, and quartiles. Um, so again, this is really important to understand. So get this down before we move on to inferential statistics because this underlies all of inferential statistics. So that is our session on descriptive statistics. Um, so again, we'll be moving on to inferential statistics next. Um, so be sure to get these down before moving on to inferential statistics. All right. And uh, that is your daily dose of statistics.